I can go? All right, groovy. All right, thanks everybody for <laughs> coming out of the, this early on a Sunday morning. You all must be insane. I don't do this kind of thing <laughs> this early. All right, so my name is Ben Sherry. Um, I have a company in Thailand, 37 people uh, called Proteus Technology, or Proteus Group. It's a development group, Proteus Technologies, and an operations group, Proteus Ops. Uh, none of which, uh, is totally relevant to what's going on here. So I am going to give you some background about me because it sets a context and I think a context is very important. So I've been coding since 1983. I've uh, been doing cryptography and security since 91. I've uh, been a libertarian like the previous guy uh, since 1992 after George Bush broke his no new taxes pledge. I discovered I was really a libertarian and not a Republican. Um, Bitcoin in 2010 and out in 2011, 2012. So I was very, I've, I've always been interested, you know, because of the, because of the, the, the freedom aspects and, and the cryptology side is what got me interested in Bitcoin. I didn't ever think that it was going to be, I didn't think that was yet going to be a currency. And I was one of the very first miners. And when it hit 40 bucks, I got out and started doing some other stuff. So do not take investment advice from me. Um, so I've avoided doing ICOs. I must have turned down 30 or 50 ICOs for my development company uh, until just recently. Uh, we did a company called hotnow.com out of uh, Bangkok. It was a hyper-local promotions thing that's going to try to be an actual currency and bring crypto to the masses. And we raised them over $50 million. And uh, so looking forward to deploying that in June. Um, Got other crypto projects in the works. <clears throat> Not all of them coin-based. And as a result, I know for a fact that this industry is completely nuts. And I'm working hard to fix it. And I'm hoping that you all in the development side will work with me on this. Okay. Why is my screen not changing? This is gonna suck. You guys can see stuff that I can't see. All right, we'll fall through. All right, so you guys, you guys know what the applications are for this stuff. Run through it. So the typical stuff that you see is coins are the main application. Um, there's various people solving various problems. Uh, one of the interesting ones, uh, you know, the real world use cases where people need these kind of things in 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 uh, Kenya. Uh, the currency is so difficult to trust that people are literally using uh, mobile phone credits uh, as, a, as a commodity exchange for, for currency. And so if that doesn't show you there's a demand for this kind of thing, I don't know what does. And uh, one blockchain or, or crypto ledger uh, group called the Stellar Organization has come in to help people uh, in these kind of lesser served countries bring, uh, bring uh, cross-border uh, financial transactions to the masses without paying massive, massive costs. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, also, we got an uh, idea of s smarter coins, right? So automated escrow. So, you know, just typical e-commerce situation uh, in, in, in Bangkok, in Thailand, it's very common for people to sell stuff through Facebook. Thailand has the highest penetration of Facebook users per capita of any place in the world. And people send their money and hope they're gonna get their stuff. And generally they do, but a lot of times they don't. And so if you have a cryptocurrency that actually provides an escrow service inherent in the coin uh, in a distributed winner, that's a pretty neat idea. And in fact, that's one of the features that uh, my client, uh, the hot token, uh, is providing. Uh, also, you can, for, so, so I like to say there's, there's, the, there's, the, there's the system, there's the crypto ledger system, and then there's platforms. Platforms are the applications and services that sit on top of it and, and utilize it. And so one of the ways to encourage people to use your coin or whatever is provide an API for the platforms, make it easy for platforms to integrate with you, and provide them incentives for using your coin. One way of doing that is for your coin to allow platforms to collect a tax when they cause a transaction on, on, your, uh, on, your, on your cryptocurrency to, to occur. So these are some extensions of the basic coin features that are, that are really obvious. And we'll, I'll talk about some other applications. So... <clears throat> impact of this, this is the socioeconomic stuff. Uh, I think we went through most of this. Um, so one of the things that's uh, important to note is that uh, 
you know, economies are really just efficient ways of transferring information. And you see these, these boom and bust cycles, these up and downs, are, are caused by people acting on bad data, data that's wrong or data that's delayed. And the internet, distributed ledgers, cryptocurrencies are greatly, you know, for the fact that the information is open and public for everybody else is making economies far more efficient, making the information uh, far more effective. And that's revolutionizing the types of businesses that we can do. Uh, like a lot of the things like the, the shared economy with like Ubers and the Airbnbs are all possible because of this. Um, another thing that I have noted in that applications that use crypto ledgers um, often end up just becoming a big open call system, like an open call exchange. If you can do an open call exchange on a, on a crypto ledger, you can build almost any of the key applications that people are going to be wanting to use in, in, in the future. And so if you're a developer, you know, think of the app that you say, you know, does this thing work on here? Would it use an open call system? Yeah, that's probably something that could actually work and, and do something for you. Uh, free markets for all, right? So uh, free markets, you know, decentralized systems route around monopolies. They route around censorship, right? So uh, these are, you know, mercantilism is the types of monopolies that are imposed on us by governments that we all suffer from. And uh, crypto ledgers are, are, the, are what's going to be the big impact uh, on this. Honestly, with smart contracts, 80% <clears throat> of what our governments do for us, what the, what the nation states perform for us service-wise, can be done free, fast, better, more fair on a crypto exchange without having to involve the use of force that comes with all governments. So this is really, truly revolutionary stuff. But smart contracts. So, presently, they're not so smart. Um, this, is, this is a real problem. Whoops, there goes the camera. Uh, Coding algorithms executing directly on the ledger. And I believe that smart contracts will replace HTTP as the, as the number one protocol uh, on the internet. Uh, the other interesting thing is actually having civil agreements, real contracts, human contracts, uh, as code. And there's actually a startup here in Singapore, they are a client of ours called legalese.com, that is taking, that is creating a domain specific language to describe contracts, mostly for starting up uh, uh, corporations and, and such. And as a compiler target, it's gonna generate a human readable language contract that the lawyers and the, the judges would expect to see. But as another compiler output, we're gonna output code that will actually execute on a crypto ledger. So your contracts can execute in this space. So let's say that you're an investor and you have an anti-dilution clause in your investment. Somebody else comes in and invests. The contract's gonna go work out all the numbers and everything and automatically give you the additional shares that you deserve for, for anti-dilution protection, right? This kind of stuff just can happen automatically in, in code and it saves you literally tens of thousands of dollars of, uh, of, of equity. Uh, the, this case came from Meng Wong, who is the guy who founded Joyful Frog Digital Incubator, probably the most successful incubator in, in Singapore. And they were given $25,000 or $50,000 investment in their people coming in for their 100-day startup rounds. But if they would go through and do all the legal stuff correctly with the lawyers, it's gonna cost them 10 grand to give somebody 25 grand, which is silly. So that's what inspired legalese.com. So imagine that your protocol is your jurisdiction, right? I can say, I can create the logic for my for my contract in my domain specific language, and I say I want Singapore to be the jurisdiction that the, that that of, of law that uh, that binds this contract, or I want the UK to be, or I want the smart contract to be, right? And people think, ooh, you can't do that without governments. Say we already do. Um, most business contracts today have a clause in there that doesn't let you go to court directly if there's a problem. They require you to go to private arbitration. Well, why can't private arbitration be a smart contract on a crypto ledger? So that is where we're heading. So the fundamental principles of crypto ledgers, I think you all know. Um, right? They're public, they're immutable, unless you're Accenture. <laughs> Accenture just patented a crypto ledger that lets you take things back. Oh my God. 
Okay, just stop doing that. Right? This is this is the problem. This is this is the hype. It's really really bad. Uh, they're peer to peer. They're not client server. Um, they're pseudo anonymous, and there's a lot of work to be making things that are more anonymous. And this is a very important uh, thing. If you want to be involved in development and you want to do something that's going to have a big impact, uh, work on work on this problem. It'll be a very positive outcome. And secured by consensus. This is really the trick. This is the challenge that people are encountering, right? Right now, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, they're doing a proof of work. Uh, my, my friend uh, yesterday was describing it as a proof of waste, and I think that is absolutely a fantastic way of doing it, right? This, this is not the future, right? There's got to, you know, is proof of stake the future or not? I don't know. There's other, there's other uh, consensus models, and the, the crypto ledger that's going to win or get the most market share is the one that's going to really do this do this a lot better than the others. Okay. So, I think you may not have noticed at the beginning of my slide, I described myself as a curmudgeon. And uh, so, I have personal opinions that are right. <laughs> and uh, I am, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out names and, and make gross assertions that will probably offend people, and you are welcome to jump in and argue with me about them as, as we go. I encourage you to do so. Okay, so that's what crypto ledgers are. Let's talk about what crypto ledgers are not. All right? Apologies to the previous talker, although he did actually clarify some things to make sure he didn't misunderstand this. Crypto ledgers are not the latest NoSQL flavor of the month. They are not databases, right? It's a log. And it actually, I mean, so if you're, if, you're, if you're familiar with databases, especially like Postgres, that have a write-ahead log, just an append-only log, that gets written through there first before it writes out to the database files and updates the indexes. So if it crashes, you can just recover from the log, right? But it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a database that you want to use as a database. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a big write-only store. Okay? Crypto Ledger is not a good place to store your secrets. If you store your secrets on a crypto ledger, you're an idiot. <laughs> you just knock yourself on the head, right? Because someday, someone is going to decrypt some of this information, right? If it's, if it's time important uh, information, then that's okay, you can put that on there. But if it's stuff that, la that lasts a long time, that's private information that you would never ever want to see, just like if I'm, I'm a photographer and I get people come to me to, to do to do pictures and you know girls ask me to do kind of certain pictures and I say don't take any picture that you don't want people to see no matter how well you think you're going to hide it someone's going to see it one day and same thing with writing something to a crypto ledger you should just assume that someday someone in the world is going to see that data if you're going to write something to a crypto ledger now what it is a great place to do is to put hash signatures of data that you have that are also signed by your private key so that you can, do, you can do two things. You can prove to somebody that you have the information because it's signed by your own, by your own uh, private key and they can confirm that with your, with your public key. And you can also, when you, when you need to reveal the information to somebody, they can rerun the hash and see that the data has not been tampered with. So you can store hashes of private data on the crypto ledger and nobody can recover your private data. But it's a good way to prove that you had it when you said you had it and that the information has not been compromised. So don't store your secrets there, store your secrets somewhere else, but store your proof of the secrets on the crypto ledger. Okay. Crypto ledgers are not efficient at all, not even close. They are by design very inefficient structures. So everyone's saying, throw everything on the crypto ledger. You know, why do you think we have all these side chains and this other crap going on, right? The the whole issue of the the whole the whole uh, architectural model of what makes a crypto ledger gives all those positive benefits that we wanted before by design uh, imposed inefficiencies uh, in it. So you know, don't think of it that way. Crypto ledgers. So this is this is why I use the word crypto ledger. I don't say blockchain because. A blockchain is a solution to the goal of what a crypto ledger is, right? Blockchains, I personally believe, are not the future. I think something that resembles more of the directed graph model, although I don't use these two systems, you know, there's hash graph and, um, or hyperledger rather, and, um, and IOTA are doing two different ways of, uh, of managing it, right? The blockchains all require that you have access to the entire data in the world, and that's that's not going to scale past a couple of years from now. So, you know, people are partitioning stuff and doing all kinds of things to hack it.
but it really just reveals that blockchain itself is a fun, has fundamental architectural disadvantages. I don't think they're the future. Crypto ledgers are not immune to cap theorem. Uh, who knows what cap theorem is? Okay, so cap theorem is the whole idea that there are three attributes for a system, for, for any uh, distributed or comp computational system that you want, and you can design an architect to get any two at the cost of one other. So the first, the C is for consistency. The A is for availability. So, so consistency means that your data doesn't get screwed up, right? Your data is correct as a whole. It's atomically correct. Uh, 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 accessibility means that you can, you can get to your data. You can actually perform operations on it. And P is partitioning, which means when you have these distributed systems that are, that are breaking apart, that, uh, that, the system, that the partitions can come back together and be, and be correct. So you can, you can operate while the partitions are broken apart. Partitioning is very interesting because partitioning, unlike the other two, is really just a time-sensitive uh, aspect. Absolutely every transaction you do, even on a local database or whatever, is briefly partitioned. While, it's, while you've written it to memory and hasn't been committed to disk, you've got a partition. You've got a different perspective of your data in memory than you do on the disk. That's partitioning. When you have an update on your local computer and it hasn't been propagated out to the network, that's partitioning. The only real difference is what is the latency of your, of your partitions. So distributed uh, crypto ledgers, by definition, have to do the partitioning stuff or they wouldn't work. And availability is the other key aspect of it. And so most uh, crypto ledger models are an AP model for cap theorem, and then they, they, they operate heuristics, which is the consensus model, which is the proof of waste, the proof of stake, whatever, to then achieve as a heuristic the consistency aspect. But the consistency is sort of a weak consistency, right? It's an eventual consistency model. Um, so if you are coding applications, coding distributed applications, uh, dApps, or whatever people want to call them, you must be aware of cap theorem, and you must be aware of which two out of the three you're focused on or you're dependent on, and make sure that your architectural model addresses these correctly. Otherwise, you will have some huge mistakes, or some big mistakes. MariaDB has their eventual consistency model, which was then demonstrated to actually have flaws. You can actually lose information in MariaDB because they're, because the C aspect of their consistency model actually had some failures in it. And uh, so this is very important stuff. Crypto ledgers are not presently able to live up to the hype. That is just a fact, right? We, you know, all the great things and wonderful things. I mean, I believe crypto ledgers are the future, no question about it. They, the, the impact of these things is bigger than the impact of the internet itself. It will be. Entire economies, entire nations will be changed. Future generations will be changed from crypto ledgers, but not with what we have today. So how do we get here? Okay. So anybody have any idea who said this? Writing a paper promising salvation, make it structured something or virtual something or abstract, distributed or higher order or applicative, and you can almost be certain of having started a new cult. Anyone have any opinion who might have said this? Just from the blurb on your thing, maybe Dykes. <laughs> wow, he's right. Okay, so Edgar Dijkstra is this uh, computer scientist, Dutch guy, freaking brilliant. And he came up with the whole idea of provably correct algorithms and code and programs. The whole concept of structured programming was his invention. Now, who knows, who has an opinion as to when he said this? He could have said this last week, right? It'd be super, super relevant because it's exactly what we're seeing today. Isn't he dead? He is dead. So he didn't say it last week. <laughs> 1979. I think he died in 2003, unfortunately. He had cancer. So seriously, folks. I mean, we've... Been, we've We've been, you know, this, this snake oil crap has been being sold, you know, forever, right? Since we've had computer scientists, and we're still falling for it. And that's the hype of, of this blockchain stuff. Right. So, I love this, right? Don't believe me for the fact that competent programming, as I view it as an intellectual possibility, will be too difficult for the average programmer. You must not fall in the trap of rejecting a surgical technique because it's beyond the abilities of the barber in his shop around the corner. Understand that surgeons in the cowboy and Indian days, in the early Napoleonic uh, sailing days, were also the barbers. But, <laughs> but this is this is the reality. Okay, we got there's so much hype and there's so many fanboys that are jumping on writing this kind of stuff. 
distributed computing is freaking hard, people, and not everybody can do it. Not most people can do it. Okay? If you're just a script kitty, you can't do it. And Edgar's a curmudgeon as me, right? Several people have told me that my ability to suffer fools gladly is one of my main weaknesses, right? So these people are spouting crap and saying nonsense. It really bugs us guys who know what the real problems are and who understand what the fundamental issues are. And I have no apologies for calling them on their crap. And that's part of what I'm doing today. Okay. So if you're a developer, you know, where's the action? You know, where, 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 where could you be playing it, right? Uh, is it Bitcoin? Well, right, it's the first, the biggest, but most of the dev work is actually on the fundamental technology. So you really have to know everything about how Bitcoin works to really even participate in, in the process. And then the people who've done it have already got a lot of experience, so it's, it's, a, it's a cool thing to be involved with. I encourage you to do so. But it's, it's not a whole lot of action going on there, except for some people early on, before Ethereum got big, forked the whole Bitcoin code base made some changes and made their own coins. And that's one way of being involved in a Bitcoinish uh, type of thing. And you can do this. Okay, so Ethereum is one that everybody knows about, right? It is the first and only legitimate smart contract system out there. There's a lot of people who claim they have smart contracts, but they don't actually execute in a, in a model uh, that's, that's distributed. They're executing on nodes and storing the results uh, somewhere, which is not wrong, but that's not really what a, for, uh, what a smart contract uh, means when we're talking about a crypto ledger. Right? Almost all the ICOs are here, right? Or there have been some that actually fork the code base, um, like, oh, what's the other one? Um, I can't think of the name. The one that we considered for hot now. No, 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 considered, didn't, didn't take it. It's a fork of Ethereum that, is it JP Morgan is behind? Ripple? No, Quorum, Quorum, right? So Quorum, is a fork of Ethereum that they already replaced the proof of work with a proof of stake mechanism so it can scale up. But in doing so, they also have private uh, oracles that are deciding your transactions, so it's not completely open, right? So there's that, there's that whole, right? The whole consensus model is, is the challenge, right? Doing the consensus right is the challenge, and that's how people differentiate themselves. So then there's Stellar and other ones. And actually for our client, uh, because of certain uh, reasons, uh, we actually are implementing their uh, distributed application on, on, on Stellar, right? And these are really specialized systems appropriate for their domains. So there's, you know, if, if you're talking about transferring uh, lots of microtransactions for low cost, really high speed, Stellar is a good possible option for you, right? It's got a very limited set of contract functions, but it's also a lot safer as, as a result. And if that fits your model, then Stellar can be good. If you want to do anything outside of that, then Stellar is completely inappropriate for you. And they'll be the first to tell you that. So it's important to know where you're going, what you're interested in, right? So, vast majority of crypto development mindshare is on Ethereum. Just about every IRC is, uh, every ICO is ERC-20 based. So learn it, know it, live it, right? This is, if you're, if you're wanting to build a your own currency or doing ICO, right now the game in town that you have to play with is Ethereum. And, you know, give the guy props. Um, he, he really did, you know, he's the first one to do it. You know, whoa. Right, so Vitalik, he uh, started it off, he was writing it in C++ and uh, Python, which were excellent choices of uh, technologies to build this kind of stuff on. And then he created the ERC-20 thing in, in uh, uh, in uh, 2015 when when the standards for how to build a token uh, became important. Now, give you some super secret true facts about crypto coins. 99% of them are complete crap. <laughs> and this is a conservative estimate. Why is it crap? Okay. Most of the people behind them. The reason why I turned down all these ICOs and people with real serious money, people, people you know, money that can make a difference in my life, uh, turn them down. Uh, because, you know, the people behind them are, are, are fraudsters, right? They're, they're, the, they're the, the classic guy, you know, exactly what Dykstra was talking about, you know, use these buzzwords and you create a cult. And that's exactly, that is precisely what they're doing. And almost anybody who comes up to you and is like pushing a coin to you is doing this to you. So you need to be able to smell it out. The best way to smell it out is to check for these two attributes, right? How does their token have intrinsic value? How does it 
why is it not just something that you could just exchange for real money, for fiat money, and do just as, and, and have a something that's more tradable, right? There's got to be some some extra value that some aspect of their business model that makes the coin more important than cash, right? If you can identify that, then you might have something that's legitimate. If you can't identify that, you know it's a scam right there. It's a complete bloody scam. Run away. The other aspect of it is there's no skin in the game for these for these people. They just produce a coin, right? They get all this money. All they have is a freaking white paper. They don't have an existing platform, right? And they say, you know, in six months to nine months, we're gonna we're gonna build this awesome crate tool. And what do you get for it? Well, you get to use the tool. They don't get any equity. You know, why, why can't you why can't you raise money legitimately? You know, through through raising private equity or or, or something like that. Well, it's because they're scammers and they wouldn't pass due diligence is the reason almost every single time. You know, so this is a great way to get a bunch of cash, not give up any equity, not dilute yourself, and you've already got the money. Actually, doing the development and delivering on the thing is a much higher risk prospect than just saying, eh, it didn't work out, which is what most of these people are doing. And so you lose your money. And if you go for this, you deserve to lose your money. All right? Now, the other aspect of why they're all crap is the technology, the tools, and the developers aren't up for the real deal. They aren't able to deliver what's being promised, right? Can't scale, can't distribute properly, have a screwed up sense of consensus, cost way too much to uh, put transactions on their environment. And these people, okay, they don't even know they're scammers, right? These, these, these people with no experience, right? And this comes from, this comes from the worst is better model of software development. In the entire history of technology, the superior technology almost never wins. Right? Have you not noticed this? You know, the guys who got the best marketing department and something that will just work, they're first, they win almost every time. And so that is the absolute attitude in startups and in everything else in this space. Well, guess what? This is the first industry. This is why this is exciting for us geek types. This is the first industry that what the code does matters more than anything else. If you have a feature that executes better, differently, gives you a disruptive impact, from a technical perspective, because our whole trust model now is now on the code and the stuff. It's not it's not dependent upon whether this guy can execute or not. The code does or doesn't work. You can see that. If you write a better system, you don't have to have a marketing department, boys and girls, your system will win. This is a whole different paradigm for development than has ever existed in our industry. Let me tell you, it's super high risk, super high profits. So worse is better is wrong. Worse is better is going to lose. The people who have been playing that model and been very successful are going to get their asses kicked. Don't be there. The other aspect is the people who call themselves experts. Right? An expert is not somebody who, given a problem, knows how to attack the problem. An expert is somebody who, given a problem, knows how not to attack the problem because they've got experience. They've done it a thousand times. They've seen it, they've seen it work and fail in many different ways. So they know the context in which to approach it. That only comes from experience, right? And the issue um, is that most developers in Asia, they don't have more than two or three years of experience. And then they get promoted to managers and they never write another line of code again, right? Because there's not technical career paths here. If you don't have five to 10 years of experience, you are not a competent designer, I swear to God. You can't do it. You can't do it for this level of complexity. You can do it for a web page, right? But you're not gonna do this. If you don't have 10 to 15 years of experience, you are not an architect. Don't even try. You're screwing with yourself, okay? <laughs> CTOs with one and a half years of industry experience. True story, okay? Got a guy who worked for me. He read about Ethereum, was interested in it. We wrote an Ethereum contract. He wrote a good part of it. First thing, you know, he wrote, he wrote like 75% of it. Did a pretty good job. Pretty simple because you can only write simple contracts on here, right? Had fun. And a company in Thailand walked up to him tripled his salary and said, you're our CTO. And he was stupid enough to take it. You know, God love him, you know, good luck. You know. uh, but you know, what does that tell you about that company? It tells you they're not gonna be around next year, but they are those scammers, right? They're gonna go and they're gonna scam a bunch of people and do ICOs and you know, they might get lucky and hit some, but every one of those things they're gonna do are fraudulent and gonna fail every one of them, I swear to God. This is where we are. So this was a very present tweet that I saw come up when it was a couple days ago, 19th March, right? I was not a computer scientist. I came up with physics. 
the transition that gives me a rather specific perspective on the situation. Computer science is a field which has not yet encountered consequences. Holy shit, is that right? Right? Because computer science is not a science, boys and girls. Okay, my uh, professor at the Southern Polytechnic University in, out of Atlanta, Georgia, a friend of mine, always used to observe that no real science has the word science in it. Real sciences are chemistry and physics, something like this. <laughs> Political science, not a science. Computer science, not a science. It's just, like, it's just like governments that have the word democratic in it. They're all communists. Okay? If you have to advertise yourself or something, it's because people don't think you're that, and you have to pretend to be that. It's not a science. Okay? Right? No skin in the game. Some very serious ethical issues for us. Now, we've been able to get away with it before, but we can't now. This is a big problem, right? So we better get our houses in order before somebody else comes and does it. And it's going to be the governments that are coming and do it. And they're going to be very brutal and nasty. And it's going to screw up the industry. We have to get ahead of it before it gets us, right? And certifications are not the answer. If anybody says that, I get to beat them up. And I will. OK, Ethereum. So this is where the action's at, boys and girls. One year after the ERC-20 coin was released, there was a DAO. Now remember that bit about never having to experience consequences, right? June 17th, 2017, programmers experienced real consequences. Existential consequences. The DAO was broken. $50 million worth of coins were stolen and a $150 plus million dollar organization was wiped off the face of the earth. Three lines of code. Now we got consequences. This is what I'm talking about. Worse is better doesn't apply anymore. You have to be correct. You have to get it right. And you have to do it better than everybody else. You can't just play around like, oh, this is a neat idea. Let's try it out. And then put people's money on there. Right? That's not ethical. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. Right, so Dijkstra again. Right, 1970. <laughs> we are obligated to produce not only correct programs, but demonstrate very simply that they are correct, provably correct. Right, has a huge influence on the way you design. People who have adopted, um, does anybody use test driven development? Okay, it's got plus and minuses for it, but anyone who's ever done it has absolutely observed that it changes the way they design and write their code. If you write the test first, that means you have to write your code to be testable easier. And that is a complete different paradigm shift. It's a different architectural model than what you would have done without it every single time. When I write code by myself, I do a test-driven development thing. And it saves me from over-engineering and, and doing all kinds of other mistakes that humans will do. So I like to call this Dijkstra's Revenge, right? He said this is freaking 1970. You know, almost everybody wasn't even born yet. We knew this problem was coming, right? But the worst is better mentality took over and won. Well, now it's back. <laughs> the ghost of Dijkstra will kick your ass. So how do we get here, right? When you've written the new application that's going to blow Facebook out of the water, and your UI crashes when people do kind of weird things, people reload the browser. No problem, right? But when three innocuous lines of code in the wrong order, wipe away millions of dollars of wealth and utterly destroy your organization, perhaps you've chosen the wrong architectural model upon which to base your future. And that is my argument here today. We are doing it wrong, and we better fix this really quick, because somebody's going to fix it for us, and it's not going to be pretty. So this is the Dow-zaster, okay? So I um, am a very process-oriented guy. And I'm also very interested in private space. And I have developed a uh, process methodology that is inspired by the Apollo program on you know, tracking processes and updating things and, and continuous improvement in processes and having independent verification of, uh, of steps as you go. So that's why when you hear the countdown, you know, you know, what, you know uh, like Tom's check, this check, this check, this check. This is them going through that process that was developed by the Apollo program. And we've adopted something like that at, uh, at Proteus Ops. And um, my business partner, who's a Norwegian guy from the UK, his, his hobby, coincidentally, is studying air crash, air air aircraft failures, aircraft crashes, 
right? And so, you know, why do airplanes crash, right? It's rarely ever caused by catastrophic failures. Rarely ever is it the wing fell off or something like that, right? It's almost never that, right? It's almost always the result of many very small, little innocuous failures that only manifest themselves in rare edge conditions. But if you fly long enough and do something long enough and play with it long enough, boom, your plane goes down. Right? So these are the kind of things that grow geometric proportions as your complexity goes up linearly. This should scare the hell out of us because the complexity of applications that we're building today because of the capacity of our computers and now that we're trying to distribute them and doing all kinds of weird stuff which some of it has a basis in computer science, like the cryptography aspects, but a lot of it does not, and they're still figuring it out, like the consensus aspects. And the consensus aspects are the most important aspects at all, right? We don't know this stuff is necessarily right. Matter of fact, we know when the failure mode is, right? The, uh, the, the, uh, the, Byzantine, the, the Byzantine general problem demonstrates, you know, after you go past the third, you're in trouble. All bets are off. So we know there's failure modes already, right? These are the kind of things that humans will never, ever see. We, we cannot catch this by ourselves. So if our tools don't catch this for us, we're gonna get more DAO problems, right? So let's talk about the DAO. This is the actual source code where the critical failure, there's actually multiple failures in it, right? So we talk about little innocuous things, but this is the place where if there was just a change in the order of three lines of code, honestly a change in one line of code, they would not have been able to perform the exploit, right? So. What happens is, right, so you get into this function, and what this is is like if, if you are invested in a DAO contract and you've decided, I never want to be in here, I want to get my money out. That's called a split DAO transaction. And uh, oh, by the way, this, this link here is, where, is a very good analysis of, of this, so uh, definitely check out this link. You'll get, you'll get more details about it. But So you get into this function, right, and right up here, it's computing how much uh, money the person is owed, and then this function here transfers the money. But notice this message sender is not declared as a parameter anywhere, by the way. It's just implied. It's magic. It's an aspect of the Solidity thing. A lot of implied aspects of Solidity. There's a problem with the language, I believe. That is not what... That, the sender aspect is not, but other implied aspects is what allowed this to occur. So you send the guy the money, and then you update your local balances of the result of that send. However, if in the call of this, this actually calls the contract for the guy that you're sending the money to, which allows him to write code, which recursively calls the top of the function. So you've sent money, and before you get down to here, he's recursively called the function. So it went back to the top again, and he sent money again. And it went back to the top again, and he sent money again. And it actually sent a whole lot more money than your balance is. And it keeps going until you run out of gas, which is the cost of actually executing the thing. And that is how they stole all this money. Now, if you had put those, if you had put that send money after you update the local balance, you move that line down two lines of code, exploit would not have worked. Couldn't have done it. Now, how the hell are you supposed to catch that? How do you know that that's even possible to recursively call that thing? All right. Script kiddies aren't going to do it. Let me tell you. You have to have serious processes. You can't do this halfway. All right. So the problem is we've got an imperative programming model with a lot of magic, object-like, uh, non-obvious behaviors. So it's not explicit. All right. You need your code to be very explicit. There's nothing going on in your contract code that you didn't intend for it to do and you didn't write yourself. That has to be something your tools enforce. Lack of atomic paired operations allows contracts to enter indeterminate states, right? That whole thing about sending the money to this guy and updating the local balances should have been a single, trans a single logical transaction that if any part of it fails, the whole thing gets rolled back. That needs to be automatic, okay? Does the term ledger not mean anything to you? You know, you, you can't do an entry on this side without doing the entry on this side and having them balance. That is the definition of a ledger. Ethereum can't do it. Can't do it. Now, I'm beating up on Ethereum. Okay, guys, 
I, I love it. I love the team. A friend of mine is on the Ethereum Foundation. They're doing a lot of stuff about this. But, right, this is, this is important. You know, we just can't like people and do this. We've got to call it. Right? In this day and age, <laughs> you know, Darkster's been warning us since the 70s, you know, who could possibly come up with such an obviously defective model? JavaScript and Golang people will do. That's who. You know, these are new modern languages that we knew all this shit before and we're doing important stuff on it. it has no business doing this kind of work. None whatsoever. Um, where I get to? Apologies. Okay. Definition of Solidity. Solidity is the programming language that most people use that came from Ethereum. Right? It's a programming language designed to prove to Ben Sherry that a greater abomination than JavaScript could gain widespread adoption by developers. <laughs> because years ago I said, never again will we ever have a language this horrific get widespread adoption in developers. I said this about seven years ago or so because I loathe JavaScript as, as, as from, from a language, I'm a language designer. Language design, I've been doing this since 1984. It's, it's, it's my sort of religion, right? We don't need another C-like language that has a broken uh, concurrency model. Golang, freaking Google, you know, who's got the power to do this shit right, you know? Holy cow, and the guys who did it know better, right? So, okay, so maybe that's not the actual definition of solidity. So let's look at Wikipedia. All right, and we we'll zoom in here. So right here in the Wikipedia thing, right, talks about how Solidity is partially at fault for the DAO hack. All right, so it's not just me saying this. All right. So how to do that? So the designer Wood is the guy who programmed it. Designed it around ECMA script. It did it on purpose. Oh my God. Amazing! <laughs> right? It's JavaScript. ECMA is this European standard. It's the standard you go to when you don't know how to do an ISO standard. Right? I used to be able to do an ECMA standard for telephony. I sent them 40 bucks in my standard. I'm an ECMA standard. I did this in the 90s. Right? You want to do a standard, do ISO. Do ANSI. Do what C++ went through. Do it right. Have people put their eyes on it and really check the thing out before anything becomes a standard. Right? I, I cannot describe a language that has been the, the epitome, the best example of how to do standards properly than Bjarni Struestrup's C++ thing. And I was involved in the very first uh, part of that back in 91-92 uh, of that. And wow. I mean, the, the language is so different than it was back then. And the way it's evolved and, and the strict... Uh, uh, architectural drivers that they adhered to, and they never they never cheated to 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 fake something out. They always held their guns of what the core architectural drivers and purpose of the language was. You know, which which caused it to have syntax issues, right? Because it comes from C. So it, I mean, it's it's there's good, bad, and ugly in doing that. But the choice they made they're always right, and it allowed the language to evolve to something that's just like so powerful. It's probably the most expressive uh, language that's ever been invented. And when you look at what the compiler has to do to get that thing to compile, you can understand. Right. So, March 23rd, 2016, this guy posts, this is this JavaScript guy, just liberated my modules. So this happened. He broke Node for everybody who uses Node. All right? And it's because NPM, which is their build system, okay, make solved builds. Right? There's little things you can do, but the way that make works, you know, so it's, it's, it's atomic, it's correct, all that kind of stuff. It's the solve problem doing builds. NPM is what, number three? We got Gulp, uh, something that starts with a B, browser or browser or whatever the hell it is. And now we got NPM. I mean, they keep reinventing everything that's been done in computer science since the 60s and 70s. And they get it wrong every time. Every single time. The Java people did the same thing. Like, my God. You know, boom. So should these people be doing our crypto ledgers? All right, this is the mentality. The JavaScript people and their influence has taken over this because it's so easy for script kiddies to get in there and do this. There's all these kind of tools for JavaScript. You know, oh my God.
All right? So we learned our lesson, right? That's a big disaster. We should, we should learn our lesson, right? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> On November 6th, some innocuous developer who wasn't even the guy who owned the code, right, for this wallet, locked up every bit of money they had. $300 million worth of wealth locked up forever. This is Ethereum? Right? Yes. Well, it's a wallet on Ethereum, right? Because the programmer failed to initialize the library and got a default value, and so he was able to assign the target address to something that was not addressable. He like put it to zero or something, which means it's all dead and you can't fix it unless you fork Ethereum, which they've done a couple times, right? Which is not what a ledger is about. I'm not supposed to be able to do that. All right, there's Metallic's response. <laughs> you know? Full stack developers, okay? Now, some of you are gonna be insulted by this, I'm sorry. If you're a full stack developer and it means that you've written JavaScript on the browser and the server, you don't know what a stack is. <laughs> and I get, I mean, I get these people applying for jobs and I'm a full stack developer. And some of them have actually programmed in backend technology like Python as well. But people, this is the freaking web. The web ain't the stack. I don't care what everybody likes to say. You know, if you've, if you've programmed AI applications and You've, you've written FPGA code that's gone to an ASIC, you're a full stack developer, okay? I'll give you that. If you haven't done that, you're not a full stack developer, quit saying that kind of stuff, right? Because that's what gets us in the trouble that we are. You know, understand what it is that you really do and where your place is and what you're good at and what you're not good at and what you have experience in and what you don't have experience in. Don't try to pretend that, you know, that JavaScript is a solution to everything. JavaScript is a solution to nothing except for you weren't a very good programmer and it was too hard for you to learn a real language. That's what JavaScript was a solution to. So how do we fix this? All right? It's a great quote. Programs must be written for people to read and only, incidentally, for machines to execute. This came out of the book, Structured Interpretation of Computers Programs, which introduced uh, the Scheme language, which was, a, which was inspired by Lisp. All right? This thing's been around a long, long time. And one of my favorite quotes of all times, Brian Carnegie, right? Debugging is twice as hard as writing code in the first place. So if you try to write the cutest little thing, right? You write your code as clever as your mind is capable of doing it, you are, by definition, incompetent to debug your own code. And that is a fact, and that is real. That is absolutely real. And this is what's going on right now. These kids who are writing this code have no ability to check that their code is correct, to even, when it has a problem, to even understand what the problem is, where it came from. And it's the problem. We have to fix this, right? So, right, the Ethereum Foundation is no doubt aware of the issue. There's a lot of really smart guys, and they're doing it for the right reason. I mean, Vitalik's reason for doing Ethereum and his, and his goals and everything, I share them 100%. I super admire the guy and all the success he's got. I deserve because he went there and did it, right? Everybody was talking about it. He went there and did it. Now, it's been taken over by a lot of people who not necessarily can, right? There's lots of development going on. There's a new language called Viper, which is inspired by Python. That is far and above better than Solidity. Doesn't go quite far enough, but gets rid of a lot, you know, Python is what one of the zen of Python is talking about, explicit rather than implicit, right? That by itself, right? They've gotten rid of inheritance and strange operations that you don't actually see going on. Nothing happens in your code that you did not write. Yay. <laughs> you know, that's a long ways to it. Solidity, by the way, you can't do unit tests in Solidity because they're broken. Everybody who writes Solidity code writes the unit test in... Ah, oh, yeah, JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a unit test, by the way. That is an integration test at best, so you're not even doing it right. Hmm. When I was writing, I, I, just start, I started doing my first Solidity code, and I started doing some unit tests in Solidity because that's the way you do it, right? And then, you know, I was like, wow, this is broken. This is broken. This is broken. Look at the code. This can't be right. I go out there and look around. Oh, I'm the only one. <laughs> Everybody else is writing it in JavaScript. They don't even pretend. And the, but, the, but, the, but the crud of, of unit testing and Solidity is still there. They just kind of stopped and didn't do anything further on it. Right? There's an entire industry of tools to support developers. I mean, it's created a lot of wealth for people who are trying to put Band-Aids on this, you know, Junky stuff that's architected badly, right? The entire virtual machine is being replaced by WebASM, which is what? 
the system for executing JavaScript. More JavaScript, guys. Uh, proof of work is being replaced by proof of stake. I think that's a positive uh, thing. I think that's an interesting thing. Um, how much do I need? Sorry, what? It's not important. <laughs> that I make an error? <laughs> that I'm railing on everybody for their stupid errors? <laughs> it happens. Okay. There's lots of improvements for performance. Now, I don't think we really, I, I don't know what they're trying to perform so much faster. That's, this has not been a problem that I run into. Issues for dealing with complexity, I, I'm issues, right? But there's not much going on addressing the issues that I've raised. There's, there's, just, there's not much activity going on this. Um, you can't deploy a contract that has more than 500 lines of code. It won't fit in a block. This is not a smart contract. This is really stupidly simple contracts. And thank God, because if they were complex project contracts, we'd be really screwed. Right, so this this flaw has actually saved probably billions of dollars of wasted uh, capital. Right, you have these tools like Open Zeppelin that that have you know that are, that are written to protect people from doing stupid things that are so easy to do with Solidity. Right, so it's got a lot of eyes on it. Right, nothing is provably correct, but they do a lot of unit testing and there's a whole bunch of people updating stuff, so it protects you against a lot of the the, the basic problems. But it does so with a massive amount of code bloat which means that your contracts have to be even smaller, all right? So it just injects more complexity and size in the end, all right? And the whole attitude, which I can kind of understand, right? They've built something, they've got, they've got you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, sitting in there. They're trying to build on top of the existing architecture. Now, changing the VM is kind of a, you know, they can do that without blocking things. There was a talk yesterday about, um, about how they're uh, supporting uh, partitioning, um, not partitioning, sharding, sharding. yeah. Charting of the uh, of of the of, of, of the blocks, and, and that's that's a cool idea, and I think it's a great idea. But you know, again, their focus is how do we do this without breaking protocols or, or changing things, and that's you know, you're going to have to, right? Right. The good question is, can this work, and can Ethereum improve before being overtaken by something new? Right. Remember what I said about worse is better. Right. Something else comes along, Ethereum could get wiped out tomorrow. Right. You do something that's going to convert the Solidity code into something that runs on your VM and you offer a thing, and boom, there's no reason for anybody to be around in, in, in Ethereum. You know, that's how the competition is. I'm going to get rid of these quotes. Oh, I like this last one, right? Program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never their absence. Okay? You don't know that it's not there, right? Absence of, not proof, absence of proof is not proof of absence. Right? You, you, must, you must know this. Right. So, what what are what are things that are that that can be done? Right. We actually have languages and tools that that can prove that code and algorithms are correct. Expressive strong type systems. C plus plus has been doing this for a long time. There's languages like Coq and Agda, and Haskell is uh, is is doing this. Uh, there's there's a, a group called Cardano that's run by a bunch of PhD guys. Now, that's pretty cool. Uh, they're taking this approach. Now the challenge is, is that I know so many PhDs, they get, you know, they can't see the forest of the trees. They get down deep into it, and they never come back up from the rabbit hole. So are they going to deliver or not? We don't know. We'll see. You know, they do have some code, but they don't have a working smart contract system that people can play with and, and use today. I'm very excited to see it when they do. It could be what kills um, Ethereum. I have issues with with Haskell as being the language. It's not a practical language for a lot of real world stuff. They have updated Haskell in the last 10 years to make it something that can exist outside of academia, but I think you need a more expressive language. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Right? We need contract complexity that's two or three or more times orders of complexity, a higher order of magnitude complexity. Right? Coins are super simple applications. They're tiny little applications. This is nothing for what the crypto ledger is going to allow us to do. Distributed, true distributed, distributed apps are really just gonna change the world, but you can't do it on top of something that can't handle this order of magnitude, right? Human contracts are far larger and 90% of their logic consists of exception handling. You know, what happens when something doesn't go as expected, right? The, 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 the happy case of, I'm gonna give this guy this much, and he's gonna give me this much, and it's gonna be by this date, and oh, wait, but if that didn't happen, there's penalties here, but this penalty, the clause, you know, what, what you expect to happen is here, and the rest of it's here, right? Contracts, you don't invoke contracts until there's a problem. That's why people are always happily signing contracts at the beginning and then regretting it when something unexpected happens because the resolution of it is not good for anybody. Everybody loses. Doing contracts right is really hard. 
Um, I believe that declarative and constraint-based systems is a way um, is, is a way to go. So um, you can, you know, if you have strong type systems, you can do declarations. The fact that it compiles it all proves that the behavior that you're anticipating is the behavior that will always occur uh, in, in your code base. This eliminates almost all the imperative errors of doing the step-by-step -step stuff, right? It keeps things transactional, keeps things provably correct. The other thing that I personally want to see, and this is something that I work on myself, um, homo-iconic languages uh, that you can build domain-specific languages with. So homo-iconic means that the, that the structure that the code is composed of is also a definition of the language it's, itself. So the language is designed in terms of itself and can compile itself, and therefore the programmer has almost all the expressive power that the language designer had in extending the language. The first two major examples of that are Lisp and Forth. And every Forth program that's correctly done is a domain-specific language for the domain that it's, that it's, that it's doing. So it looks, appears to be English-like at the, at the end. All this stuff's been around since the 60s. Um, but it also has some very big power that you need to be able to reel in and, and limit. This is, a, this is a bit of a challenge, um, but you know, we should be able to get this right by now. And domain-specific languages are very important. Right, so like when we do a lot of logistics stuff. So I've been working on a warehouse management system. You buy a warehouse management system for a million dollars, which is cheap by the way, especially if you're going with SAP. Your integration and deployment and getting it configured to do your warehouse processes can cost you three million dollars. That's very, very typical. I've been doing logistics, uh, goodness, since 1990. And I see this all the time. It's like a like the cost of acquisition of the technology and then tripling it to actually integrate it. And it's because uh, it's very, very complex to, to configure these things. If you have a domain-specific a domain -specific language that uses the nomenclature that the people in the warehouse are used to, they may not be able to write the code initially, but they can look at the code and tell you if it's wrong or right. And after a little bit of practice, they can do it. So we're building a domain-specific language for, for logistics and warehouses that's gonna make it where the integration cost gets really, really cheap. And the purpose of us doing this is so that SMEs who don't have a whole lot of access to technology can now participate in the e-commerce space. That's a one other thing, All right? So, you know, these are just the things that I observe from my limited practical experience in, in crypto ledgers and my interest in, in language design, right? It's just scratching the surface. You, everybody here, I bet, could think of a good idea, All right? So. Techno Utopians, there's a guy who mentioned this uh, phrase yesterday. I was going, wow, right up my alley. Uh, there's you, it was him. Outstanding, yeah, right? They predict a post-scarcity economy. Am, am I right? It's one of, the, one of the things we're talking about, right? They, and I like to see this, you know, our reputations will be our, our, our currencies. You know, how many likes can you get, okay? Well, this is all crap, right? These people love to tell us what to do and they never suffer the consequences of their hubris. This is what you will see every single time. You'll know that you're talking to one of these people when their advice to you is not necessarily gonna have any consequences if it goes disastrously wrong for them. All right? This is again, when I talk about skin in the game, talk about ethical concerns, right? Ethical societies, economic models require skin in the game. Integrity, not reputation, is your ultimate concurrent, uh, uh, currency, right? Integrity is the one thing that nobody can ever take away from you no matter what. You must do something to violate your own integrity. Right? It's your most important capital. It's your biggest asset ever. Do not squander it by participating in these crappy ICOs and doing stuff that's stealing people's money when there's a lot of legitimate work that of real value that you could be doing of consequence instead. Right? Manifest this in your code, your work, and your life. I'm going to see if I can make this trick work. I've been, I've been talking without a mic the whole time. Let's see. I'm a loud guy. Night watchman, Yep. Can anybody hear this? Yep. Yeah. I think it's funny, huh? This fucking room can move as a fry cook, man. Yeah. You know, I could be manager in two years. King. God. Full stack developers. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned testing and development. 
Yes. Yes. Sure. Um, so, space program, right? They require that. You know, it's, it's expensive to launch the rockets and test them and launch them again. <laughs> Got to be right the first time. Um, I've also been involved in the healthcare industry, and I've been involved in the telecom industry. And telecom used to require this, and now it's not so much. But uh, yeah, so but I mean, you're you're talking about you're, you're talking about multiples of extra cost to achieve the same result in the same time. Um, there, there's no question about it. But some things do require it, and a combination of both. Now. Once we have languages and tools that support this, it's going to come down. I think this is what we really need to focus on. So I, I think you have. I, I do not think that test driven development is a panacea. Um, I think it's a good technique. It's one tool out of the box. But formal verification for like for, for things that are dealing with big financial numbers, you have to do that. I don't think test driven development is 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 adequate. Right? It's 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 empirical, but it's not provable. So, anything else? Yes. Uh, we can't call ourselves computer scientists. Can we call ourselves software engineers? I believe that we can now. <laughs> but okay, so in, in the same in the same line as, as as architects and engineers, when you go get your certifications, which I which I loathe, but when you look and see what the certifications are, they don't test your engineering knowledge. They don't test like you know the tensile strength of stool. They test that you understand the safety factors so that your building won't collapse and kill the people inside it. That's the test. Right, so it's testing that you know how to prove that your design is correct. It's not that you know how to do it, or that you can do it. It's that you can prove that it's correct. That's what all these tests show, and so that's what we need. You know, so if we are doing that, so we are applying scientific methods to a solution that we have a lot of heuristic and 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 um, and empirical evidence to support that this will work, and that is engineering. So yes, I believe that we can if we're doing that. Right? If you're not doing that, then you're a full stack developer. Yes? Thanks. This is a really enjoyable quote which you asked from my colleagues and developers. That's as lucid as yours. But the question is I mean, I used to be a developer. I probably didn't mention during my speech yesterday, I used to be a developer. And uh, so, I mean, you're saying basically JavaScript is, uh, let's, say, let's, let's be blunt, they don't necessarily the most uh, efficient or whatever tool, right? And solidity is an insult to injury, which I, I think I agree without even knowing the detail. But so how do you propose to fix this? You're, like you said, going back to what we had already built, like at least for a fourth or something, it seems like it was also generated languages and trying to bring that, for example, to develop smart contracts or this kind of distributed ledger, or what would be your recommendation? Because like you said, right, the Ethereum enterprise elements on Ethereum, I mean, let's face it, these are a bunch of kids, and I'm not saying it really, but they are a bunch of 20-something kids who, sure. it's their first job. They are not necessarily even good people. That's right, right? They have good intentions, right? Uh, they just don't know what it is that they don't know. You know that what they say, how the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so the idea <laughs> is that these guys need to learn what's mathematics, what's algorithms, mm -hmm. what system theories are, and then they can but now they got that spotlight, so how can we move this in a way that everyone benefits? Because they have the power, so to speak, right? Yeah. Well, we all do, but they have the cash to do it now, yeah. right? <laughs> and they have the time on their hands. So, um, so, so the answer is that the language that is going to satisfy you know, the requirements to do this has not yet been invented. Um, I'm trying. I'm working on some stuff, uh, me and my business partner. But, you know, but everybody needs to put in on this. But the, but the attributes you know, that I described are what, you know, I don't know what the language is going to look like, but the attributes that I put in here are what needs to be present in those. And, and frankly, the, the languages like, like Agda and Cock and all this kind of stuff that really have really impressive type systems are not very practical to use. Now, they might be practical, you know, like, so like if you now do a domain specific uh, language that puts together things inherent in, in, in what's needed for these distributed apps, you know, the like transactional, atomic, uh, complete, you know, being complete and, and stuff like this, you can make those keywords in the language and hide the complexity, right? So what is, you know, is, is, is computer programming an art or a science? Well, Who says it's an art? Who says it's a science? It's okay, uh, you guys are lame. <laughs> Take a stand, you know, and make assertions. My assertions may not be right, but they're most entertaining even when they're wrong. You know, do that. Um, so it's more of an art than a science. 
is 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 the argument that I would that I would make, and um, you know, so we we've, we we've got to do the things that it, it's. What is what computer? What we're all doing as programmers, right? The 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 business of computers is the highest risk industry that's ever been invented in all of human civilization since warfare. No joke. Has the highest failure rate too. Okay, you know some people say you know if if, if the if the project delivers value at the end of it that the project is a success. Even by that measure, sixty percent of all software development projects fail. My measure of success of a software project is if you go back. In time and told the the stakeholders that this was going to be the outcome, and they still said yes, I'll do it. That's a successful project, right? Under that measurement, more than eighty percent of software projects are failures. And this isn't even the complex stuff that we're talking about here, right? So software development is the art art of managing complexity. It's taking crazy complex problems, breaking them down into simply complex problems, breaking those down into simpler problems. Bring those down into easy problems and bring those down into stupidly dirt simple, you can't possibly get this wrong, and then putting it all together again without losing information. That putting it all together again, being able to break it down and put it all together, that's your process, right? And this is what your architectural drivers are supposed to accomplish. And so that is what computer development is about. And so understanding the domain you're in and making languages that know what the key issues and problems of that domain are and building those as inherent protections. You know, these are constant recurring patterns. They become the nomenclature that we use and speak to each other. If that's enforced by the technology, it's going to allow us to be very expressive, very powerful, very prolific in being able to deliver value to our customers. And until the tools are at that level, we're not going to get the benefit of what crypto can do. Now, we need to do, it's very important, the reason why I'm so adamant about this, we have to do it really fast. Because the governments now are seeing it, and they're seeing the, the impact from it, right? The Dow reinvented a thing called bearer bonds, which all the major governments spent the entire 90s outlawing and going to little islands that were offering it and saying, you don't have access to banking anymore until you quit doing that. Bearer bonds is when you had stocks. This is the way all stocks used to be. You got the stock certificate, you showed up at the shareholders meeting, and however many stock certificates in your hand was how many votes you had. They didn't register your name or anything like that, right? So governments say, whoa, we can have that. Well, guess what? It's back, right? And if we get ahead of the game, we can do it before they can stop it. And I'll give you an example of someone who did it is Jack Ma. Jack Ma has got this thing called Alipay. That there's beggars in the street in China who got QR codes. We'll take Alipay, right? It's everywhere. They can't get rid of it. He's now got a capitalization that's greater than half the countries on planet Earth. That's his private currency. Right? It's not open, it's private, but it's his. China can't stop it. Right? Now, if he was starting it today, boom. Right? They'd have protections on it and, and it wouldn't go anywhere. Right? So this is why it's important that we as developers, this technical community, have to get our own house in order before somebody else does. And before some you know the stuff's inevitable. Right? The nation state, the purpose of the nation state is about to drop. We're going to see governments, I think, becoming more like Singapore, city states that are, that are local and dealing with, with local personal issues. You know, small government can be efficient. Governments do not scale. No consensus mechanism, which is what a government is, but it uses force, ever scales. Never in history. Right? The United States works because it was a confederation of 50 small states doing their own experimental thing. As our federal government has grown big and, and eroded those rights, we're, you know, we're, we're going the way of Rome. If we don't do something, that's what's going to happen to America. So, you know, you know, the EU, holy crap. <laughs> you know, they just put the, you know, they're dying. They're a dinosaur. Right. It's just a question. It's like the Soviet Union in the 80s. We knew it was going to go away. We didn't know if it was going to go out with a bang or a whimper. Right? Fortunately, it went out with a whimper. Crypto ledger is going to work. It's going to take over most of what governments do. Everything except for the the, the, the police and the and the military is pretty much going to be able to be done better uh, with this. That's going to happen. What we don't know is how many casualties are going to be on our side before that happens. The further, the faster we go in advance and make this a reality that they can't that they can't uh, crack down on, the nicer it'll be for us and the better we'll all be. So. Like, Right. So, none of them is even close. I mean, IBM is the bank part of this, right? Mm. Because whatever the metric is, and uh, why isn't no one 
overtaking Ethereum in your view? Because Ethereum, it's like your MySpace or Facebook, right? They remain right. that they, they popularize <coughs> this whole thing, and then someone's going to come and take over next year. <coughs> Well, because they're all thinking small. They're all thinking that the coin is the app is what everybody's trying to do. They're all thinking it's the money that's the thing. And I'm saying that the definition of money is about to completely change. So they care about the wealth that they have. They see it from the perspective that they have right now, right? All the banks with the hyperledger crap, the goddamn guy patented it. Okay? That's never going anywhere. That's dead. I don't care how good it is or whatever. Somebody's going to do it differently or better than him. It's going to be open and, and it's going to win. Hyperledger's dead. It was dead from the day that he did that. But all these private banks, you know, that's exactly what they want. And they're just using the terms, right? They're just stealing the terms. It's like everybody who was an ISO 9001 consultant suddenly become an SEI consultant. And then those same guys rebranded what they were doing and called it Agile, right? They're just using the terms. But it's, it's fraud, and it's fraud. You know it's fraud based off of the, uh, based off of the questions that I, that I put up before, you know, how you evaluate if this is a real, this is a real deal or not. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not just the small guys who can't raise money legitimately that are defrauding people by the abuse of the of the crypto ledger. It's the big guys are doing it in an even bigger way, right? Because they've got because it's because it's a threat to them and they want to control it and they want to hold on to it. But you know, by its nature it, it, it cannot. It cannot. So anything else? Alright, I really appreciate you guys coming out this early. <laughs> I didn't want to <laughs> yeah.